Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm delighted to see such a fantastic turnout for this webinar. I'm Lindsay O'Neill. I am faculty in the Master of Science in Structural Design and Technology program at Cal State Fullerton. And on the side, I do a fair bit of uh, training and consulting on things related to instructional design. So let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, this is an hour webinar. I like to finish on time. So if you have some place to be in one hour, uh, you will be there. Okay. So here's what we'll cover today. We'll cover how people learn. Of course, we can't go in depth because we only have an hour together. Uh, we'll cover learning theories. We'll cover memory, motivation, and feedback. And we'll cover a couple of instructional design models. And actually, we'll start with the, with the models at the very beginning there. Now, this uh, webinar and the, the succeeding webinars are sponsored by the MS and Certificate in Instructional Design and Technology program. So I have to spend a couple minutes thanking this program for making this webinar series possible. Um, California State University Fullerton is a large regional university in Southern California. I do teach for the program full time. So of course I have a vested interest in this program. Um, we do have two programs. We have a Master of Science program. It's a two year program. And we do have a certificate, which is only three courses. You could knock it out in a couple semesters. Uh, what's great about this program is it has been completely online since 2002, so we, we know how to do online and we've been doing it well for a very long time. If you're interested, more information online at ed.fullerton.edu forward slash MSIDT. And on that website, you'll find links to our social media, including our YouTube as well. And I'll make sure that you have my contact information as well at the end of this program, if that's something that you would like to follow up on for any reason. All right, so that's enough promotion. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's start with what instructional design is. I'm an instructional designer. When I tell people I'm an instructional designer, they have no idea what I'm saying to them. They always say something like, oh, you mean like wallpaper, paint colors, choosing furniture, that kind of thing. They think I, I say interior design. There's just no focal point or, or point of reference for um, instructional design, which is kind of funny. So then I explain what I do and I say, well, basically instructional design is all about creating effective learning experiences. Uh, more specifically, Instructional design is the systematic structuring and development of content and experiences to facilitate learning. And this is a, this is kind of a, a loosey goosey concept, right? I mean, people's eyes are gonna glaze over when you say this. And honestly, when you are an instructional designer, you've been doing it for a while, this is that, that cheesy meme. This is kind of what it, what it feels like to be an instructional designer. You spend a lot of time kind of considering all the variables and figuring out the best way to solve a problem. I'll also describe instructional design as um, solving any sort of instructional problem. Uh, I'll also describe it as, uh, it's kind of like the line between educational technology and learning science. So it's a really nice blend of um, how people learn and how to use technology to get them there. And technology can be anything. It's not using technologies for technology's sake. It's using technology to solve some sort of problem. So let's move on. So when you're an instructional designer, there's a lot of things that you have to know. There's a science of learning. You have to know a little bit about educational technology. And this doesn't mean, you know, using VR, virtual reality, to solve all your problems. It means, again, using existing technology that works well and it's going to work well for your instructional problem. Uh, you have to know design processes. Because, again, instructional design is, is very systematic in um, how you actually prepare your learning experiences. Got to know a little bit about usability, a little bit about graphic design. Got to know a teeny bit of coding. I get asked a lot if you need to know coding. It helps to know coding, but really you just need to know a teeny bit of coding to be really successful as an instructional designer. Uh, you'd also have to know a little bit about accessibility and copyright. I include this slide just for kicks. Uh, job titles in the field might include any of these. You could be an instructional designer. You could be a learning experience designer. You can be an instructional design librarian if you are in the library field. It's a really varied field with a lot of specialties. And I like to say that if you're interested in instructional design, there is a niche out there for you. Maybe you'll have your regular job and do a little bit of instructional design as part of it. Maybe you'll do a lot of instructional design, but it could be in a wide variety of industries and in a wide variety of positions. You could be on a team. You could be a solo person, you could be doing it all yourself, or you could be delegating your work to someone else. Um, 
one former student I know actually went on to do just a needs analysis for a new company that works with the military. All she does is analysis of instructional problems. I thought that was a really interesting specialty for her to have. And it's not, that, that doesn't float my boat, so <laughs> good for her. All right. So again, just to reiterate, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat box. If you're not familiar with Zoom, just look for your toolbar and there should be a little button that says chat on it. Any chat questions you enter or comments you enter will go straight to me, not to the entire room because I have the meeting locked down. Okay, so let's talk about instructional design systems and models. Again, if, instru if instructional design is all about being systematic in how you plan instruction, we love models to make that happen. The two major models are actually Addy and Sam. You've probably heard of Addy. It's the one that gets trotted out a lot. Addy is just an abbreviation for Analyze, Design, Develop, Implement, Evaluate, whereas Sam is kind of a, a newcomer to the instructional design scene. That's an excitingly named successive approximation model. Model. And it's a simplified model where you're actually going to analyze, develop, design, and then repeat. Let me make a quick note here. Okay, so Addy is commonly described as a waterfall model. The idea with Addy is that you spend a lot of time in the analysis and the design phase, and only then, once you do a really thorough analysis, design, got everything ready to go, then you develop it, implement it, evaluate, and that's it. It's kind of just like a, a one-way road. You go straight through, that's it. And so it can be a little bit um, inflexible as far as if there are any major changes or hiccups that happen. Uh, it can be kind of difficult once you've spent so much time on the design process only to find out that it's not working in uh, the, the implement phase or the evaluation phase and to go back and to redo all of that. So in contrast, there's the SAM model, and it's just the three steps, analyze, design, develop. The idea with SAM, or again, the successive approximation model, is that you're gonna spend a lot more time prototyping. You're gonna do brief analysis, brief design. You're gonna start right away developing. And the idea is that you're going to kind of repeat this process a few times. By the way, if you hear any weird noises behind me, we've got construction going on in my neighborhood, so I apologize for that. Okay, so um, quick recap on this. Uh, Addy is more of an emphasis on analysis and design. It's time intensive and really you got to do it right the first time because it's difficult to go back and make any corrections to your analysis and design that you might have missed in the first go around. But you know, if, if you have a really big project, maybe this is the right model for you. If you're working with a big team, uh, it's a known problem, you feel confident in what you need to achieve, it's, it's going to work fine. In contrast, um, Sam, you dive in quickly, adjust as needed, it's more about prototyping and there is lots of uh, revising involved. So it really just depends on kind of your personal style, maybe what you're working on and maybe what your experience is, uh, which model you choose. And again, this is not the most exciting part of instructional design, but I wanted to make sure we started with the model so we can talk a little bit more about maybe how these steps work in practice as you go through the process. All right, so let's pause a minute. Let's do a quick knowledge check. I've got two questions for you. So into the chat box, again, uh, your chat will be private only and will go to uh, me rather than the entire meeting. If you'd pop into the chat box, um, what do you think, which model puts more emphasis on pre-development work like analyzing and design? I see your answers coming in, beautiful. Yes, wonderful, thank you. It's so nice when you respond because then I, I know that you're there and you're listening and I'm not just talking to myself. It's kind of a weird thing about webinars, right? Yes, Addy. Addy has got a big emphasis, analysis and design. It can be difficult to go back and redo these things if you have any hiccups later on. All right, so use this model if you'd like to start prototyping as soon as possible. Beautiful. All right, thank you so much. Okay. So again, if you have any questions, please pop them into the chat box and I will be happy to answer those as we go through the uh, session here. Okie dokie. So let's move on to how people learn. Again, we're only here for another 
49 minutes together. So if you are interested in diving deeper into how people learn, this book is kind of like the industry standard of as far as recommendations for learning more about how people learn. Julie Dirksen did a really wonderful job of illustrating and simplifying and kind of chunking the process to really give you a really good insights into how people learn. Um, unfortunately, it's not available as an ebook, at least not to libraries I've checked, uh, but you can pick it up fairly inexpensively as a paperback. It's a wonderful book. I really recommend it. So let's do the uh, kind of Cliff Notes version for the purposes of our webinar. To start with, uh, learning experiences are going to be shaped more by preferences as well as disabilities. You might have heard a bit about um, learning styles. There's not really there's, there's no science to back up the fact that if you think you're a hands-on learner, you're gonna learn better as hands-on in all subjects. If you think you're a visual learner, you're always gonna learn better visually. Uh, what you, how you teach something really depends also on what's being taught. For example, you're never gonna become really good at math just by watching someone do math, right? You actually have to dive in and do math problems yourself, check your work, practice, 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 and get that kind of feedback as you go through the learning process. You know, no one's really gonna learn just from a lecture. They need to sit down, they need to study, they need to do some sort of active learning on their own or as part of the class, if the instructor set that up to help them uh, really master the content. Basically passive learning is not gonna really result in long-term effective learning. There's always has to be an active component to uh, whatever's going on. So additionally, oops, um, I will cover this. I can't remember which session I'll talk about this. Uh, I also recommend using a universal design for learning principles. Um, let me make a quick note here to myself. Um, and this is just about kind of uh, offering a variety of formats in a learning experience if you can, as far as um, letting people choose what works for them. So if someone prefers to read versus watching a video, they can do that. And you know, what you might prefer might change from moment to moment. I mean, if like if my baby's sleeping, I'm gonna prefer to read something rather than watching a video. But if I had the choice, I would probably watch the video. So let's think about maybe how your learners uh, learn best and maybe what opportunities you can give them to kind of choose the format that they are interested in using. All right. Additionally, learning experiences are always going to be more effective when learners are active and engaged. In webinars, I mean, I've attended a lot of webinars myself as well as presenting them, it's really easy to tune out, to go on your, your browser, start shopping, maybe have your phone out. And if you space out during a webinar, you're not gonna learn anything. And there's a lot of uh, constraints inherent to this format itself that's never gonna be as you know engaging, as active as, as probably a in-person environment. But there are some things you can do in any online learning format to help make sure that people are active and engaged. You have to be motivated to pay attention. If someone's not paying attention, no learning is gonna happen regardless of how amazing your instructional strategy is and how well you've planned something. Uh, and feedback is always gonna be critical to the learning process. It's one of the reasons that, that lectures are generally ineffective for long-term really effective learning because there's no check in the process to make sure that your learners are actually getting it. There's no point at which you can find out if you have a misunderstanding, if you have an incomplete understanding. It's really important to build in checks to a learning process to help facilitate fixing anything that's going awry in the learning process. So that's one of the reasons um, social design is, is very critical of the old fashioned sage on the stage kind of passive learning model where it's just someone talking at the front of a room because you don't actually know if the learners are learning and they don't know oftentimes if they're learning until they get to the midterm or until they get to the final exam and then find out the hard way that they didn't actually understand the concept after all, or maybe they didn't even know exactly what would be on those exams. So instructional design is all about being really systematic and planning out a learning experience to make sure that there is active learning that goes in and to make sure that there's basically no surprises throughout the learning process. It's really about focusing on the learner, making sure that's going to be an effective learning experience, a motivating learning experience as well. So I'd like to talk about um, a couple of uh, big learning theories that we talk about really often in the field of instructional design. Uh, I did use this book, Foundations of Learning and Instructional Design Technology, to help me prepare uh, some of these um, notes on the learning theories. Um, this book is available online. You can do a quick search for it. It's just an open textbook. I think it's a little bit 
too comprehensive. They took the E format and basically used it to dump the, the whole kitchen sink in, but there's some really nice um, opportunities to do further reading or to reference concepts in it. So I recommend uh, this book if you want to check out further uh, information on these things. All right. We use learning theories in instructional design as a source of verified instructional strategies, tactics, and techniques. Uh, just like evolution, we call it a theory. All these things are theories, but they are really good explanations that kind of showcase how people learn and help explain how people learn and also give you some guidance as an educator on how to be more effective when you plan instruction. Uh, these theories do provide the foundation for intelligent and reasoned strategy selection. Again, what you choose as far as um, how you're going to teach something or what learning theory you choose and to help you figure out how to teach something really de will depend on your learner and what they should be able to do after the learning experience. The emphasis in instructional design is always going to be on what people are going to be able to do, not just what we want them to know or, or think, what we actually want to be able to see them do after the learning experience. And you might use more than one theory in any given learning experience. And it could be dependent on the topic, or it could be on even level of mastery. So let's talk about what these big three learning theories are. We see these again and again in instructional design. There's lots more than three learning theories, but these are the three core ones that we kind of refer to again and again to get started when we are talking about how people learn. All right, we're gonna talk about behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. So let's dive into an explanation of each. All right, behaviorism. Remember Pavlov's dogs, they're trained to drool when a bell rang. What's interesting about behaviorism is that it treats the mind as a, as a black box, meaning that we don't really know or care what's actually happening in the mind, which can be kind of a, a dehumanizing way to view learning, but it still can have its place in instructional design. Basically, only the input and output matter to this learning theory. Proponents of this think that the uh, right input and reinforcement will result in the output that you are looking for. So I'd say it's a little bit more maybe instructor-centered rather than learner-centered. Um, however, this theory can be very useful when you are maybe approaching designing some sort of learning experience relating to something really basic. Like maybe you just want to make sure your learner has memorized some definitions, recall some basic information. Behavioral uh, learning strategies can actually be really helpful for structuring some very basic learning experiences that are going to be built upon in the future. All right, next up is cognitivism. I know I'm going through these really quickly. I apologize. If you do have questions, let me know. Oh, I do have a question here in the chat box. How much does um, our uh, MSIDT instructional design program teach about learning theory? Um, Mandy, maybe uh, let me go ahead and just type in my email address. Will you go ahead and send me an email? I know the rest of you can't see this comment in the box. Go ahead and send me an email and I will um, reply to you about that. Okay. Um, cognivism. Again, this is kind of a cliff notes. We do cover some of these things in uh, the instructional design program. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't recall exactly which classes. We start introducing them from the very beginning of the program and then we build on them. We actually have in, in the instructional design program, I believe we have a semester long class where we just talk about learning theories and instructional strategies, but I'd have to look it up. I don't teach all of the classes, I only teach some of them. All right, cognitivism. Um, yes, uh, sorry, one more note in the chat box. Yes, I will drop my slides into the chat box at the end of this presentation so you can all have a copy of those or I'll also put in my email address uh, at the end so you can also email me if you'd like a copy of my slides. All right, cognitivism uh, treats the mind as a computer. So this theory is a departure from behaviorism in that it is involved with what's actually going on in someone's mind, uh, but it is considering it as, to, as more of a computer where information is coded and structured and it's gonna fit in with your existing information. It's kind of like when you when you save a file to a computer. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of you that actually just save them to the, um, desktop, which, you know, is, is chaos to me. I, I can't imagine having unorganized information on my desktop, but to be able to find a file later on, it needs to be kind of filed away in a certain place, right? So if I'm teaching a class, I put files related to that class in the same file as other uh, 
in the same folder as other files related to that class. So basically when I have something new, it's going into a place with um, like information, so I'm kind of connecting it to my existing information. So again, kind of a, a weird way to think about the mind, but it can be helpful when you structure a learning experience to think about what your learners already know and how they're going to process and integrate whatever you're teaching them into their existing knowledge. So it does start to kind of treat people as um, you know, more unique individuals. The idea with cognitivism is that um, the learner is active and engaged in the learning process and learning activities should be chunked and designed in a way to facilitate processing by the learner. And I encourage you to think of um, learning objectives and uh, backward designs. So if you've ever seen Bloom's Taxonomy, where it's that, it's that colorful pyramid that has different levels of learning in it, that's, um, that's a cognitivist uh, learning scaffold, basically. Okay, so that one, okay talked about that. All right, so constructivism. In constructivism, learners create meaning from experience. Uh, the heart of constructivism is that learning must occur in context, and most interestingly, uh, each mind constructs its own unique reality. Learning is not objective. This is kind of a weird, a weird way to approach um, designing a learning experience. It can be a very difficult way to approach a learning experience because to, to create a really effective constructivist learning experience, you have to kind of carefully manage the, the environment around someone to make sure they're not going to come to um, a misunderstanding or they're not going to go off the rails completely. Uh, in this model, learners are encouraged to construct their own understandings and then to validate through social negotiation these new perspectives. Again, this is pulled from that, that open textbook I, I showed you earlier. It's, it's a really interesting model that's more about um, like apprenticeships, Montessori style education, experiential learning, um, things where you're, you're kind of where the learning needs to be used is kind of where you are learning something. And of course you can do constructivist experiences in a formal learning environment like a classroom, but it can take a, a bit of work and you know a lot of practice probably to do this really effectively. It's kind of a, a tricky model. All right. Just to recap, there's no one perfect theory. There are many more theories besides. We have limited time together, but I recommend you know seeking these out and learning more. Um, again, selection will depend on your learner and what they should be able to do. So again, the subject is going to matter. Um, what what level of learning they need to master is going to matter and how this might fit into a larger experience is going to matter. Again, behaviorism might be a great place to kind of start layering your learning as far as making sure people have the definitions they need to be able to understand larger, more complex concepts later on. It can really, it can really um, depend on, on larger experiences as well. All right, so let me pause for just a minute. I'm gonna go ahead and take some adjustments here. Okay, so I got four knowledge checks here. These are a little bit tricky. Again, uh, your response, can you just pop that into the chat box? It'll go straight to me, not to the entire group. So let's start with this scenario. Students are asked to write brief bios for figures involved in the Civil War. Then they're asked to analyze these figures' impact on events in the Civil War. What do you think this is an example of? It's just a quickie, quickie knowledge check. All right, so your answer is coming on in. I'll give you a moment to reflect. It's a little bit tricky. So this is an example of cognitivism. This is an example of cognitivism because we are scaffolding the learning uh, situation here. It's a basically a straight, straight scaffolding. This is a lower level of learning where you are asked to read brief bios and remember some basic facts for these historical figures. And then you're going to build upon what you are just remembering and doing a basic understanding of and you're going to analyze the figure's impact. So I should have put Bloom's taxonomy on here but the, the lowest level of learning is always going to be remembering and understanding in the cognitive model. And above that is it's analyzing 
oh gosh, I can't remember the other ones off the top of my head, all the way up to applying and you know creating. So this is a, a scaffolded learning experience. It's a good example of cognitivism where you start with something basic and then you ask them to do something more advanced. So I've got a couple more of these. Next up. All right, so students have a spelling test. They're tested on basic memorization and then tests with failing scores must be taken home and signed by their parents. I hope you all don't have any terrible flashbacks to uh, elementary school. I see your answers coming in. I'll let you consider that for a moment. Yes, you got it. It's a perfect example of behaviorism. We don't care if they know what those words mean. We don't care if they understand where um, those words might have originated as far as language. We are only interested in the fact that they know how to spell them. So straight behaviorism, we're just doing the input. We're looking for a certain output. We don't really care what goes on in their heads. And then to kind of emphasize the importance of as far as a reinforcement of this behavior we're trying to get out of them is if they fail, those tests are going to have to be signed by their parents. And that's going to make failing kids very sad, potentially. All right, next up. This one's tricky. In this one, novice computer users are asked to demonstrate powering up a laptop and opening Microsoft Word. Then the users are asked to use Word to type a letter to a friend and then print it. What kind of experience do you think this is, A, B, or C? Yeah, this one's kind of, um, kind of funky. So I guess this could probably just be considered pure cognitivism. I label this as behaviorism and cognitivism because in the first step, we're looking for a really basic behavior. We're just looking for computer users to power up a laptop and open Word. We don't really care if they know what the laptop is or what Word is. We don't really care if, if they know the context for these things. We're just looking for a very specific output related to this this action we're going for, then we are asking them to kind of use their, their minds a little bit more by using Word to type a letter to a friend and then print it. So let's say the second clause there is more cognitivist because they are applying concepts and the first one is more behaviorist. All right, I got one more of these. All right, sixth grade students are conducting independent research and we're asking them to create an original diagram that illustrates the impact of pollution on marine life. This is an example of behaviorism and cognitivism, cognitivism or constructivism. I see your answer is flowing on in. I'll give you a moment for that. All right, thanks so much for popping in your thoughts there. This is an example of constructivism, kind of a, a minor example. Again, constructivist experiences are kind of difficult to scaffold out. I mean, theoretically, in general, you should have some sort of prior learning experiences so they know maybe what marine life is, what pollution is, but then maybe your final kind of capstone project could be a constructivist project where they're conducting research and making something, creating something that illustrates a specific concept. So the idea here is that they're going to construct their own understanding of this topic of marine life. And then they are going to uh, create a diagram that, that illustrates that. So they're constructing their own understanding. They're expressing it in a unique and original way. A teacher would have to be kind of closely by their side through the process to make sure they don't come into any misunderstandings and to make sure when they turn in their final assignment, they're not gonna have gone again completely off the rails. Um, that they're going to have stayed on target. So again, constructivism is um, the idea that, that learning is more subjective. There's no really objective one understanding of a reality or, you know, learning. This, this can get a little bit philosophical as far as um, your own educational philosophy goes, but it's, it's an interesting topic to kind of keep in mind as we talk about learning theories and wrap up this conversation. So that's it for learning theories. Any questions at this point? Feel free just to pop those in the chat box. Now, if you have any, feel free to pop those in. I'll go ahead and move right along. Let's see, you've got 29 minutes left. I am pretty much on target. That's great. 
All right, so let's talk about memory motivation and learning. So, so far we've covered um, kind of the systematic process of uh, doing design as far as um, Addie and Sam, the actual process itself. Uh, for as far as choosing a learning theory, you'd probably do your analysis and then in your design process, you would think about who your learners are, how they're gonna learn best, what you're teaching, and that's the point at which you would choose a learning theory. And then you're also gonna consider memory motivation and learning to kind of get a handle on what your instructional strategy would be so your actual development process so we, we don't really cover too much of analysis in this webinar because that really can depend on your learners but there's really wonderful sets of guiding questions out there um, deciding what you're going to use to teach your learners as part of the design process and then building out would be the development process so let's talk about um memory uh, this is a very overly simplified model. The, the point of learning is that the experience for the learner is you want to get something into their short-term memory and then really hopefully right here the arrow is where the magic happens. That's the actual learning part where they're putting it into their long-term memory. Any learning that happens in short-term memory isn't really going to be anyone's end goal basically right if you're actually going through the trouble of creating a learning experience you want to move past long short-term memory and get your users to integrate it into long-term memory and then even more ideally there's there'd be another step where you get them to actually you know apply it in real life for example if you are um, teaching them something to use at their job or teaching them some sort of skill they could use as a student that's a whole that's a whole another step but we'll, we'll start with the overly simplified version here where the magic happens right here where we get things to be integrated into long-term memory. So this is right up there kind of with cognitivism where you are kind of thinking about how to structure a learning experience for your specific learners in a way that's going to kind of integrate with um, what they already know and understand. Okay, I mentioned this earlier, but learners have to be paying attention to be able to learn. This probably seems very obvious in hindsight, but again, part of instructional design is motivating your learners to pay attention. It's something you have to think about when you're designing a learning process. I like to say that um, my goal is always to design learning for the way people are and not the way that I wish they would be. I wish that everyone that was taking one of my learning experiences was really naturally motivated and I didn't have to worry about them having any follow through, but that's just not the way people are and that's totally fine. So learners do have to be motivated to pay attention. There are strategies for uh, motivating learners more, but I would say um, one thing you can do is integrate active learning into a learning experience, and uh, this can help motivate learners because they are working through the learning process themselves. They're figuring out uh, what misunderstandings they might have. They're being forced to pay attention, especially if you're in person or you have a lot of control over the learning process. Uh, both motivation and attention paired with active learning will help learners kind of make that leap from the short-term uh, learning to long-term learning. And then instructional design as a whole tends to be more focused on adult learning. Uh, there are tons of instructional designers that work in K through 12 or at children's learning companies, but just so you know, there is a bias in the field towards adults. Adults are more likely to be self-motivated as long as they see value in the learning experience, while children are more likely to be motivated by external factors. Again, think, you know, taking the spelling test home to be signed by your parents. Think, um, when I was in kindergarten, I'll never forget, we had the stoplight system where green meant you're, you're being good. If you had to pull a yellow card, you know, you're getting in trouble here. Red card, you had to go do timeout or, or whatever it was. So that's more motivating for children when it comes to learning as well. Um, I got a question in the chat here. How much of paying attention and remembering is related to memorization? Um, I mean, there's different levels of learning. I would say just straight memorizing is going to be more of a behaviorist experience. It's kind of at the bottom of the, the whole learning hierarchy, right? Um, so you need to know certain facts to be able to be successful in a larger learning experience usually. So I would say that the basic level, it's really important to pay attention from the start. I mean, with any learning experience, you want people to be paying attention to the whole thing, but they need to be paying attention to the building blocks as well so you can help prevent misunderstandings later on. I hope that answers your question. If you have um, a follow-up question on that, please please put that in the chat box and I'll, I'll address that. Okay, let's talk about what short-term memory is. Short-term memory is just 
the things kind of in the front of your brain that you retain really temporarily no longer than one minute. It holds the information you're thinking about or aware of at any given moment. Short-term memory is when you go to the next room to get your keys and then you go in the next room and you forget what you're there for. You walk through that door and you go, I don't, I don't know why I got up off the couch. Why? I know there's a reason I got up off the couch. Um, and the reason for that is you put the, you put the thing you need to do in your short term memory and then poof, it's just kind of gone the minute you think of something else. So this memory is also known as short term storage, temporary memory, primary memory or working memory. It's basically a place to store really temporary information or to work on something really briefly. Uh, if you need a further illustration, if you've ever seen any of the Finding Nemo franchise, Dory only has short-term memory. Once a minute or two passes, whatever she was thinking about is gone and she kind of resets. So that's short-term memory. All right, so what does short-term memory do? It accomplishes two tasks. It stores information briefly, and you can use it to work on that and other information. And what I love about short-term memory is that there is a magic number for short-term memory. It's seven plus or minus two. This number refers to the number of things you can retain in your short-term memory at one time. For the average person, you can think about seven things and hold on to those in your short-term memory, plus or minus about two. So think like, you know, a phone number, if you aren't including the, the area code, there's seven digits in a phone number. There is a reason for that because that's pretty much all you're gonna be able to retain in short-term memory as, you know, you approach your, your telephone to actually dial something and I'm probably, you know, dating myself here. <laughs> Otherwise you just have it stored in your, your cell phone. But anyways, all right, long-term memory. So that's short-term. And the idea with long-term memory, and again, the learning process is that information has to be transferred from short-term to long-term to stick around permanently. The first step to accomplishing this is to make whatever the learning is sticky and easy to process. And maybe I should say this, this is what instructional design is. It's figuring out how to make learning sticky and easy to process. Maybe I'll add that to my, my list of definitions. So let's talk about capacity of short-term memory. So we can kind of start to talk about strategies for how you can help people convert information from short-term to long-term memory and actually keep that learning around for the long haul. Um, just a quick disclosure, this activity is not my work. I pulled it from um, a textbook. I found it in the 1988 version, but it gets used a lot in psychology circles. It doesn't really get attributed. So that's my best guess as far as where it came from. Then the citation is in my PowerPoint here and I'll share that with you. All right, so let's try an example of short-term memory. I'm gonna give you a list of 12 letters, see how many you can retain in order. So let me pull out my timer here really fast. So next slide is going to be a list of 12 letters and I'll give you uh, one minute to see how many you retain in order. Are you ready? Oh and don't don't use a pen, don't use a pencil, pencils and pens down, just use your, your short-term memory. Ready? Let's go. Okay, give you another 20 seconds or so. About 10 seconds. Okay, that's it. All right, how many did you remember? If you would like, go ahead and pop them in the chat box. I can uh, help you start to check your work. Ooh. We have some people with some very good short-term memories. Very nice. I'm impressed. And again, again the, brain, the brain is also a muscle, so if you are good at, at memorizing things and holding under the short term memory. I mean, that's something you can practice, but for the average person, you're not gonna remember it that many. So go ahead and uh, check your work here. The answer is, or to recap, it's T-J-Y-F-A-V, 
MCFKIB. It's a random string of letters. And there's lots of techniques out there that if you're not practiced at this, you can learn to be really good at memorizing short-term information. Um, but most of you probably didn't do so well. It seems like a, a lot of you in the chat box have incredible short-term memories, but let's go ahead and try this set of 12 letters instead. I'm only gonna give you a, a few seconds here because I'm, I'm confident you can get this one. Give you a few more seconds to consider this. Okay, calling it. Finished. Did you all do better this time? Do you want to do you want to pop your your memorization of that slide into the chat box? Yes, good. Did better this time. Yep. Look at all those really wonderful short term memories. <laughs> Someone's combining the ones from the first the first one too. All right, wonderful. Thank you for uh, playing along with me. Um, this is the, the recap, TV, FBI, JFK, YMCA. Yeah, uh, I agree that the association does help. This is familiar information where you are um, uh, tying it to existing things that you already know. And these are also the, these are the same letters you saw the first go round, but they were sorted and grouped into four separate words. So one strategy for short term learning is taking information that is new to you and tying it to something that you already know. Um, and also chunking information is another way to help make the most of your short term memory. You can memorize more information if it's chunked into short bits um, versus if it's just little individual pieces that are broken into the smallest possible component. These 12 numbers or these 12 letters were chunked into four elements that could be handled easily by short term memory. Remember, the magic number is seven plus or minus two. Generally, you can keep about seven things in your short term memory at any given time and actually kind of work with them plus or minus two if you have a better short term memory. If you're interested in short term memory or memory at all, I really recommend the book. I'll pop this into the uh, chat box here. There's this wonderful book called Moonwalking with Einstein with it's it's based on a reporter that covers the world memory championships and the world memory memory championships they're handed a um i'll say pretend this is a deck of cards so actually you can't see anything because i have a weird zoom background on participants as one of the activities are handed a deck of cards and expected to memorize every card in order in that deck of cards and how they do it is they actually come up with really elaborate memorization schemes where they can take this kind of insignificant information, the, the suit and number of each card, and attach it to something they are familiar with it, and they can actually turn it into a story that they can keep in their short-term memories, and then they compete based on who can um, memorize the deck of cards most efficiently and the quickest. It's an amazing book. It, I don't want to say it changed my life, but you know, it changed my life. It was great. I really recommend it. All right, so that said, notice all the things in your life that are chunked, phone numbers, Social security numbers, there's a little space in between. It's easy to remember, remember 426, 18, 8734. Credit card numbers are chunked. Um, instead of being 16 numbers you have to memorize, you can remember each uh, chunk as its own individual bit of information. I have memorized one of my credit card numbers. It is a blessing and a curse for online shopping because I never have to get up to get my wallet, but I memorize it in the, in the four number chunks, not just the whole thing. So I have to remember the order and, and the chunks. So that's kind of how, um, a quickie lesson on how short-term memory works. So you're probably thinking, okay, what are the implications here for learning? The idea is that I encourage you to break up your teaching into chunks. Another reason lectures don't work is because you're doing kind of a, a, a big dump of information a lot of time onto your learner. You're not giving them a chance sometimes to kind of catch their breath, to process what they're learning, to figure out if they have any misunderstandings. So one thing you can do is if you do need a lecture and you know lecturing happens, I'm lecturing now, I recommend following the 10 and two rule, 10 minutes of lecturing, two minutes active learning. Again, it's, it's challenging depending on what your format is in webinars. I don't know if you are all paying attention unless you're participating in activity. So thank you to all of you that did. It feels really good to know that you're all there with me. Um, but my goal is always to kind of, you know, pause periodically, 
to give you a chance to kind of process what we already talked about, to give you a moment to reflect, um, time to process, okay? So again, all this stuff's going into your short-term memory, but if you don't have a chance to sit and digest, it's not gonna make it to long-term memory or it's not going to make it completely into your long-term memory. And the bottom line here is that active learning helps transfer knowledge into your long-term memory. So the more active learning you can do, uh, the more likely it's transferred to long-term memory. And active learning doesn't always have to mean that you know, you're having learners do a worksheet and then you're grading the worksheet. It could be them reflecting. It could be them you know, doing a poll. It could be your learners learning from each other, either in pairs, like a think pair share, where they just like turn the person next to them and kind of communicate their understanding. It could be group work. It could be lots of different ways that your learners can get the feedback they need to make sure they're understanding and to make sure that they are um, transferring into long-term memory by doing that. Okay, so again, if active learning is critical, feedback is really, really important to make sure that they're getting it right, because if they are transferring something to long-term memory, you wanna make sure that it's, it's the correct version of whatever it is you're teaching, right? You don't want them to have this misunderstanding that, that is in their long-term memory for the long haul. I think all of you probably have had the experience where you learned something incorrectly the first time and then every time you think about that thing you can't fix your misunderstanding i'll give you a really weird example and this actually um is, is a fairly recent revelation to me i'm being i'm being vulnerable here as an instructor when i was a kid someone told me that cauliflower was actually broccoli that had been grown in the dark that is not true I know this is probably shocking to many of you as well, <laughs> but every time I think about cauliflower, I can't unshake that thought. That was my first learning of what cauliflower was. It, it, it's permanently in my brain forever. And one of my favorite phrases for my own instructional design program when I got my master's was, was that first learnings are powerful. There actually are physical changes that happen in your brain when you learn something. Your little neurons change shape from, I think it's, um, I can't remember the order, umbrellas to lollipops or something. There's a physical change that happens when you learn something. If the first time you learn something, you learn it incorrectly, it's very difficult to dislodge that misunderstanding. So to me, cauliflower is always going to be broccoli that was grown in the dark. It's probably the weirdest thing you'll hear today. You're welcome. Um, so feedback is going to help people prevent those misunderstandings. If someone had, you know, maybe told me, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not actually what cauliflower is. I might not have lodged that into my brain permanently. Um, feedback also supports learner motivation because again, it's an active process. They're being treated as, as people and active in their own learning. So it can be very motivating when they can see that they're getting it right or they're getting it wrong and they have the opportunity to fix it. And feedback also makes the learning experience more meaningful. Again, everyone wants to have some, some control over their learning and being able to get feedback and do some active learning helps people you know, feel like they have some personal agency. I see this comment here. White trees because broccoli are green trees. Yes, exactly. Bro cauliflower is just, just white trees. Okay, and I got another link in this um, PowerPoint as well if you'd like to read an interesting article on the power of feedback as well. So I have been talking very quickly, but we are actually going to end on time and that is fantastic. And let's talk about, in brief, what does this mean for you as an instructor or as a trainer or as an educator or whatever your role is in the educational process? When it comes to instructional design models, so again, we talked about Addie and we talked about Sam. If you're doing a systematic planning using either, either model or something else you've come up with on your own, it's gonna help you make sure your lesson is more focused, learner-centered and scaffolded or structured to support learning. So a lot of the time we don't have a lot of, as much time as we would like to plan a learning experience. And so as an instructional designer, I mean, we still don't have all the time we want to plan a learning experience, but you've got some shortcuts in mind to kind of help you speed along the process. The more you are systematic in what you plan, the faster it goes in the future. You can always reuse stuff that you've used in the past to help make something faster, and you can always improve things in the future. So if you want to improve your learning experiences going forward, don't think you have to get everything perfect right off the bat. There's always revision later on. I always screw things up the first time, but in the future, I tend to do a little bit better. All right, so memory and motivation. I recommend breaking up your teaching into chunks. This works for lectures. This works for webinars. This works for online asynchronous learning as well. Uh, if you have some sort of course or 
tutorial you're teaching online, I still recommend breaking it up into chunks. It does give your learners time to process using breaks and learning activities. Um, if you're using, say, a lot of videos online that are recorded and you have maybe a recorded lecture, you can just take that lecture and break it up into five to 10 minute chunks. And no one has a long attention span when it comes to videos unless it's like binging on Netflix and those things are basically engineered to be really addictive. When it comes to learning, no one has a really in-depth attention span. Basically everyone can focus for about 10 minutes and then they need a break. So this is the way people generally work, generally, not, not all of you. Um, so I recommend just kind of structuring your learning accordingly. That will help people have the time to process and put things into long-term memory. And again, feedback is gonna still going to help support learner motivation and make the learning experience more meaningful. All right, we did talk about learning theories. We only talked about three. There's tons more out there and there's tons more nuance than I was able to communicate. But theories are great because it's the science of learning. They provide strategies and tactics to you as the educator to help create effective learning experiences. What you use depends on your learners, how they are learning, and what they are learning. Remember that, that meme I had at the beginning of the woman considering the math, multiple math equations? That's how it feels probably to all of you to be educators and even more when you get deeper into instructional design. There's so many variables. The more you do it, the easier it gets. Maybe I should say the, the less hard. Okay. That's enough of my talking. If you would, in the chat, just write one thing from today's session you can put into action today. Give me a minute to do that. Got a question here. Have you heard of the USER model for librarians completed, created by Char Booth in 2003? I have not heard of the USER model, but you've intrigued me that you mentioned it, so I will look it up. All right, so I see a lot of your comments coming in. Something you can do today is chunking. 10 and two rule, chunking for asynchronous rule, taking more breaks, thinking about how memory works. Yeah, my goal is always to provide, you know, really concrete strategies in my, in my webinars. I'd say 10 and two rule, if you walk away with one thing, if you can walk away with that, that's a, that's a really good one to walk away with. Okay. I'm gonna look up Charbu. Thank you, Jennifer, for that, that uh, suggestion. Okay, so that is, it. I actually finished a few minutes early. Thank you again to our wonderful sponsor, the California State University MS and Certificate in Instructional Design and Technology. Um, if you're interested in that, we do have a website with tons more information. Oh, I will put in my email address. If you have questions, please feel free to email me. Oh, and I was going to put my slides into the box. So let me go ahead and find my slides and I'll put those into the chat box for you to download. Give me just a moment. And meanwhile, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat box. Um, if you have some place to be and you don't want my slides, then feel free to move on with your day. I had the window open where I had them, and then of course I closed it. Oh, where is it? There it is. Okay, so I'm dropping my slides into the chat box. They are processing and going through. They're a little bit big. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your day to be here. This will be recorded and posted to the uh, MSIDT YouTube channel. I believe that's linked from our website. Meanwhile, um, if you have some place to be, please go ahead and get yourselves there. If you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to hang around with me and I will make sure those get answered. I'll go ahead and stop the recording here. So um, thank you all so much for attending. <laughs>